Hello and welcome to this journey through the events of one of the lesser known colonies of the New World. The Scottish attempting to settle in modern day Panama and the not so warm reception they got from their new neighbours. If you enjoy hearing about the exploits and lives lived by those who came before us, including events you may not have delved into before, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Thank you. Darien's scheme was Scotland's attempt at colonising the New World. In this video, we will look at the political climate that led to such a scheme, how the colony fared, and what effects the expeditions to Central America did for Scotland's path in the world. We start with gaining an understanding of what those living at the time knew of the world they lived within in the 15th and 16th century. The Western understanding of Earth's geography was inherited by the Europeans of the late medieval period from the Roman Empire. It was a world that's outer borders stretched to Iceland and Greenland across the Atlantic to the west, with accounts from history of Viking sails reaching the coast of Newfoundland, today a Canadian province, and other stories of Ottoman explorers perhaps finding similar success. But those stories were seemingly lost in the flowing river of history, sinking well to the bottom, embedded within the silt and sand of the past. As power shifted and languages changed, the ability to preserve knowledge over the centuries was a difficult one. The Vikings may have reached Newfoundland and the North American continent, but the information of such a discovery was not one that was perfectly preserved or passed between civilizations. It is not truly known how much knowledge the Vikings themselves had of these exploits committed by their cultural kin. From Greenland and Iceland, the people of the 15th century and earlier knew that their world stretched across Europe to the frozen edges of Russia but no real understanding of what was beyond. The trade routes that reached the capitals of European nations zigzagged across Eurasia, from the Bosphorus and around the Mediterranean into North Africa, then stretching through the Arab world and down into India and the Spice Islands beyond, China being a distant but acknowledged region of mystery, with no direct link to the Western world, but goods flowing throughout the Middle Ages into Europe on a regular basis goods that had passed through many hands and had an incredible markup added to them by each hand that held them. It was this desire by the Europeans to gain produce from the Far East at a lower price and on a much larger scale that drove the start of the Age of Exploration, or as it is also known, the Age of Discovery. This time period is loosely considered to be from the mid-15th century to the late 17th century. It was not until European nations took to trying to find sea routes to this easternmost part of their known world that large-scale trade to Europe exploded, the beginnings of globalisation and the shipping paths that we still use to this day. These routes to the east were of great value and intrigue, but the discovery of the new world by Europeans would be a geographical discovery greater than any other in history, a discovery that was largely due to Europeans trying to reach Asia by sailing westward around the globe. There are many claims about the first Europeans to reach the New World to the West. There are Viking sagas about some of these claims. Leif Erikson is thought to have possibly landed on continental North America half a millennia before Christopher Columbus. Who knows how different the world would look if Vikings had started large-scale interactions with the native population at such an earlier point in history. But alas, as the story goes, it was Christopher Columbus's voyage in 1492 in which he found the Bahamas, and the island of Hispaniola, modern-day Haiti and the Dominican Republic. The island split into two nations, the Spanish-speaking Dominican Republic and the French-speaking Haiti. Christopher Columbus on his subsequent journeys of exploration over the next decade would enslave much of the native population, the Bahamas being largely uninhabited for almost a century due to the majority of its population being taken to the island of Hispaniola or dying from the ravages of European illness and disease that their bodies had no experience with developing antibodies for. This period was marked by these types of exploits, humans doing what they have always done to each other on every corner of the globe, enslaving and exploiting each other. The New World opened up vast financial opportunities for the European states. They found new crops and fertile soil, alongside vast amounts of gold and silver, Many countries during the early 16th century were taking advantage of these discoveries, first the Portuguese and Spanish, then the Dutch, British and French, with animal hides, tobacco, sugar, rum and raw materials flowing across the Atlantic. Many men were becoming rich due to these exploits. When labour became the issue, the Europeans tapped into the vast African slave trade. The Portuguese had already explored much of the African coast by the end of the 15th century, 
They established relationships with African kings and tribal leaders who were willing to sell their enemies and weaker neighbours into slavery. Entire coastal towns were dedicated to housing slaves until they were bought by their new owners. The Middle Passage was a stage of the transatlantic slave trade that worked in a triangular pattern. European ships would head down to the West African coast, capturing, or much more likely, buying slaves from the Africans. Buying them was more preferable than raids, as the life expectancy for a European in sub-Saharan Africa was very low due to the lack of treatment or experience with malaria. And the African slave trade being so large, it was not difficult to procure slaves from the native traders. The ships would be filled with slaves in unimaginable conditions and transported to the New World, with the West Indies and Brazil being large hubs alongside Central and North America. From there, the slaves would be loaded up in exchange for the American goods mentioned earlier and sailed back to Europe, thus a triangular slave trade. In this push for riches, it was a moral race to the bottom, in which no country was totally free of guilt. Even a country of what we think of as a historically persecuted population, the Scottish, made failed attempts at colonisation in the New World. The Darien Scheme was the name of this ill-fated Scottish plan. The Scottish were late to the party compared to other European nations, with the Dutch, English, Portuguese, Spanish and French already having large colonies in the New World and vast amounts of wealth sailing from the Americas back to their mother countries. One of the Scottish architects behind this attempt at glory and wealth was a banker named William Patterson. Born in 1658, William Patterson was a trader and banker who was one of the original founders of the Bank of England. He made his money predominantly through the transatlantic slave trade and after spending time in the West Indies as a younger man, devised the idea of a colony in the Darien Gap on the Isthmus of Panama. He took his idea to the English government, who outright rejected it. First, he went to James II, King of England, Scotland and Ireland, who could not be convinced. He then took his idea to both the Holy Roman Empire and the Dutch Republic, who for their own reasons both rejected the idea as well. He would then abandon this scheme and focus on earning his fortune, but over a decade later, after becoming a wealthy man, he would turn his focus back to his great scheme. To enable this plan to take place, he had to gain money, support, and a population of colonists. Since none of the larger powers were willing to entertain him, he took the plan to his own people, the Scots. So Patterson went to the Scottish Parliament and proposed this plan as a way to break away from English rule and the domination they had over trade. Little did he know, it would in fact do the exact opposite. Scottish Parliament were much more receptive to his ideas and formed the Company of Scotland, or as it was also known, the Company of Scotland Trading to Africa and the Indies. The initial purpose of this company was to create an East India Company-esque trading system to allow them to exploit the resources found in the East Indies, Africa and the New World. The initial goal of the company? To raise £400,000, which was achieved far quicker than expected, with one eighth of that amount being raised in just weeks. With public subscriptions accepted and stock certificates issued, many viewed this as a true chance to change their fortunes and gain the prosperity that they had heard so many European neighbours had benefited so fruitfully from. So, after reaching their financial targets of £400,000 of English sterling, in 1695 they sent a reconnaissance expedition, the mission being a success, returning the news that the region was suitable for settlement. The idea itself thought up by William Patterson was not a bad one. He wanted to effectively control the slimmest piece of land between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, therefore being able to bring vast riches back from the Asian Pacific overland and across the Atlantic back to Europe, effectively what the Panama Railway and later the Panama Canal were created to achieve. Obviously, they also planned to ship large numbers of African slaves to the colony, to work in the mines that were well known in the region, with the Spanish already having large colonies and mining operations in the area. And so, with this initial expedition successful, the scheme was launched into full effect, and two years later, Five ships and 1,200 people set sail for Central America. So confident was William Patterson in his plan, he himself led the expedition, alongside Thomas Drummond. It is the same Thomas Drummond 
who was thought to have been associated with the Glencoe Massacre, the murder of approximately 30 MacDonald of Glencoe clansmen after they failed to swear vows to the new English, Scottish and Irish monarchs, William III and Mary II. Now with the full backing of Scotland, Drummond and Patterson led the expedition. The five ships, St Andrew, Endeavour, Dolphin, Unicorn and Caledonia, left the port of Leith in Edinburgh in the summer month of June 1698. The fleet stopped at the island of Madeira, off the North African coast on their journey southward. They then restocked in the West Indies. There they took control of an island in modern-day Puerto Rico called Crab Island, an island that had once been viewed by Patterson as a potential settlement for his vision of a Scottish empire. After several failed attempts to buy the island from the Spanish in the years previous, the Darien expedition claimed the island in Scotland's name. With that first baby step of Scottish expansionism complete, the Darien expedition reached the coast of Darien in Panama on the 2nd of November, six months after the fleet left harbour from Leith. The settlers decided on the name Caledonia or New Caledonia. They stated that from henceforth, they and those that came after them would be known as Caledonians. Caledonia being the name the Romans gave to those who resided north of the Antonine Wall and the River Forth. In modern day terms, the word is used as a poetic, all-encompassing term for Scotland and her ancient mystical history. From such hope of the Scottish Empire, the reality set in fast. Within eight months of landing, only a quarter of the 1,200 settlers were alive. It requires a multifaceted analysis to see why things went so wrong, but it truly isn't very complex. The land they had chosen was disastrously treacherous. Far from being an ideal spot for a colony, it was swamp-ridden and marshy, and the ground seemingly not suitable for large-scale cultivation or agriculture. Although it may have appeared reasonable from the coast, and only 80 kilometers in distance from the Atlantic to the Pacific Oceans, seemingly perfect for this overland trade extravaganza, it was highly inhospitable, and as the summer months came around, the death rate had risen to 15 people a day. Malaria was rife and ripping through the population. The natives had no interest in trading with the settlers, and although they did not have large-scale conflict, did not trade with them to any great extent. The settlers did manage to erect a 50-cannon fortification called Fort St. Andrew before too many of them had succumbed to illness and death. But many of the more senior men remained aboard their ships, where they slept and sought refuge from the reality of colonial life. Due to large-scale spoilage of food and no agriculture or trading, starvation was widespread, and the few that were able would try to hunt giant turtles as a source of sustenance, as many others succumbed to alcoholism to deal with the reality of their plight. Other than the poor conditions for creating a settlement, the Scots were also dealing with their new colonial neighbours, the Spanish. They had already claimed much of the New World as their own and had already developed large colonies. They viewed this uninvited incursion from the Scots as a source of rivalry and aggression. In July 1699, a Spanish fleet entered the region and demanded the Scottish leave the area immediately and abandon their capital of New Edinburgh and Fort St Andrew. The Spanish tried to use force, but were repelled by the Scottish force numbering around only 300 people at this point. But this put further strain on supply and morale. Although the Spanish fleet withdrew, they continuously launched small-scale raids and collaborated with native tribes they had made alliances with to burn Scottish crops and pester their planters. This, alongside the hell that the Scottish had been living through anyway, was enough to convince the surviving settlers, including Patterson and Drummond, two of the initial leaders, that enough was enough, and they left, headed to Jamaica, where British forces denied them access to ports under the orders of William III, also known as William of Orange. It is this attitude from the English that led to the Scottish blaming them for the failure of the settlement. The English did not aid the Scottish settlers in any way. They actively worked against them when possible. This was not due to pure hatred and dislike of Scots, as is sometimes portrayed, although I'm sure the English had no great hope for the Scottish to establish a trading empire and become an even more independent nation, the decision-making was much more tactful than hateful. By this point in history, William III was ruling over the Dutch Empire and England, Scotland and Ireland, along with all of their holdings. William was in the midst of a war in Europe and had just come out of the other side of the Nine Years' War, 
a conflict that saw the Grand Alliance battle against the power of the French Empire. During this conflict, the Dutch and English found the Spaniards fighting alongside them against the French. Due to this political situation, William had no interest in needlessly upsetting the Spanish by aiding the Scottish in their new settlement that was on what the Spanish considered to be their land. After being rejected by all ports within the Caribbean, the men finally made it to New York, a town of less than 7,000 people at this point in time. News did not travel fast in this age though, and on arriving in New York, Drummond learned that two vessels had already been sent to New Edinburgh to resupply the Scottish settlers, and so he commissioned two vessels and set sail back to their new capital. Doomed as this entire endeavour seemed to be, on arriving back in Caledonia, they found the burned remains of the Olive Branch, one of the ships sent to support and resupply the Scottish settlers. Before Drummond had arrived, there had been an accidental fire on board the Olive Branch, leading to its destruction. The survivors left on their second vessel for Port Royal Harbour in Jamaica, but just like their earlier countrymen, the Scots were not allowed ashore, and the ship was struck by disease and pestilence. With news really limited by the speed of sail to cross the globe, the Scots kept trying to support their endeavour, with five more ships arriving the next month in Caledonia, with another 1,200 people on board, almost a year after the initial voyage landed. The new settlers were not impressed by the sight that awaited them. They had come on this voyage with plans of joining an exciting new colony, with endless opportunities, not a partially destroyed and desolate capital, with huge amounts of work needing to be done immediately and almost no infrastructure in place. Soon clashes of personality occurred between Drummond and those chosen to lead the second expedition, with Drummond insisting the fort needed to be rebuilt in preparation for what he saw as the inevitable Spanish incursions. These clashes eventually led to Drummond's arrest, and then the colony sliding further towards their doomed fate. As deaths continued and the struggle only became harder, only one glimmer of Scottish glory came from this story, and that is the last battlefield victory of an independent Scotland. In late 1699, Captain Alexander Campbell of Phonab arrived in Caledonia, sent by the company to help secure the settlement, a military man who was highly capable and highly motivated. The Spanish had been continuing to harass and kill Scottish settlers. The governor of the nearby Spanish colony of Santa Maria, modern-day northern Colombia, had been given the task of rooting out this Scottish pest. The governor had established a fort on a large hill in the Darien region called Tubacante. Here, he amassed a force of 1,600 Spaniards, far larger than the colony of the Scots, let alone their fighting population of men. The Spanish governor planned a naval blockade to stop any more supplies reaching the Scottish, which had become their only real source of gaining supplies. And at this same time, he was to launch a land attack to deal the final blow. Captain Alexander Campbell had some altogether different ideas on how he wanted to proceed. He decided that using the element of surprise, he would do the unthinkable. He would attack the Spanish. With 200 men and 40 native tribesmen, they trekked through the dense and inhospitable jungle. Using the Kuna tribesmen as guides and navigators, they stormed the Spanish position, driving them from their stronghold and capturing a group of prisoners and claiming the governor's prized personal chest of gold and belongings. A final hurrah of the fierce Scottish will to fight and to set their course within the Americas. Campbell was, however, seriously injured in the assault and fell seriously ill. With this lack of leadership and still low on supplies and in poor health, the Scots were in a poor position still. The Spanish, using their vast resources and foothold in the region, regrouped and trapped the Scots in Fort St. Andrew, a fort that through another poor planning decision had no access to fresh water. Just a couple of brief months after their glory at Tubacante Hill, the Caledonians surrendered. By the next month, all the Caledonians had left their brief existences in Central America behind them, and the Spanish burned and destroyed all signs of their existence. Some Scots went to Jamaica, and with the Darien scheme now in ruins, were allowed into port. Many lived in the Americas for the rest of their lives, 
Some unfortunate Scots were captured by the Spanish, reportedly suffering under the persecution common to those who the colonial Spanish encountered. Alexander Campbell made it back to Scotland, playing a prominent role in the formation of the independent Highland companies that would eventually become known as the Black Watch, the 3rd Battalion of the Royal Regiment of Scotland. William Patterson, the architect of this plan, was so sure of his endeavour with views of Scottish glory and wealth, he even took his wife and children with him to Caledonia. He arrived home in Scotland alone, widowed and childless. Out of the total of over 2,500 total settlers, less than 300 are thought to have survived. The failure of this project threw Scotland into an apparent tailspin, with over 25% of Scottish capital at the time invested in this scheme of colonisation, an absolutely mind-boggling and staggering amount to be invested in any one place, and already struggling people were thrust into absolute destitution. This also coincided with what is known in Scottish history as the Seven Ill Years. Estimates suggest between 5 and 15% of the Scottish population died due to widespread famine, with some estimates stating that in certain areas, one in four people lost their lives. It also coincided with the coldest decade in the past 750 years for Scotland, with failed harvests in 1695, 96, 98 and 99. People were reduced to eating grass, nettles and rotten meat to survive. All of this combined is what ultimately led to, or at least sped up the process, of the act of union between Scotland and England, the merging of these two nations within the title of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. There is still resentment from the Scots towards the English for the lack of help provided, and the pressures they placed on the Scots to join the Union. The Union took place just seven years after the failure of the scheme, the colony failing in the year 1700, and the Union taking place in 1707. The directors of the Company of Scotland who sent so many of their Scots to their deaths and who Captain Alexander Campbell, the hero of Tubacante, is said to have never forgiven for what he saw as the treacherous nature of the company, not providing adequate supplies and money for the settlers, then abandoning them to their doomed fate. As is often the case with great power, they were absolved of their sins, with the English government giving them a payment of £400,000 to match their lost investment in exchange for them voting in favour of the Act of Union. In 1727, the Company of Scotland became the Royal Bank of Scotland. Those in power maintained their coffers, while the beleaguered settlers die in misery and disgrace. The banks will always be bailed out, it seems, while the average man is left to lose his fortune and fight in the gutters for survival. That is, if he hasn't died already. And so, to end this video, we go to the Company of Scotland and their empty motto, uttered to send men to their deaths as they attempt to find freedom by enslaving others. That which opens the world unites it in strength. The power of such words and their empty meanings have sent men to their deaths for millennia. Unfortunately, the Scottish were no different. Thank you so much for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe and leave me a comment telling me what period of history you're most interested in and maybe it will give me some inspiration for my next video. Thank you very much.